John J. DeJoya, President of Georgetown University, Andrea Mitchell, NBC News Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent, the Honorable Tom Ridge, First Secretary of Homeland Security, the Honorable Michael Chertoff, Second Secretary of Homeland Security, and the current Secretary of Homeland Security, the Honorable Janet Napolitano. Well, good morning. I wish to welcome all of you to Georgetown University for this morning's event, the Department of Homeland Security, Year 8. We have a proud tradition here at Georgetown of welcoming national and global leaders to Gaston Hall, a home for public discourse for more than a century. And we continue that tradition today with the visit of our first three secretaries of the United States Department of Homeland Security, Secretary Janet Napolitano, Secretary Michael Chertoff, and Secretary Tom Ridge. And it's an honor for us to have all of you with us today. We're also grateful to be joined today by members of Congress. And I wish to thank the Aspen Institute and the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service for bringing us all together today. In particular, I'm grateful to Walter Isaacson, the President and CEO of the Aspen Institute. I'm grateful for his friendship and for the spirit of collaboration that brings us together today. It's an honor to be able to welcome the members of the Aspen Institute community here to Georgetown, as well as colleagues from the Department of Homeland Security, and to express our appreciation for their support in organizing our program. I'd also like to thank our students of the Georgetown University Lecture Fund for helping to staff this important event. And finally, I wish to welcome Andrea Mitchell, NBC News Chief foreign affairs correspondent and the moderator of today's conversation, and I want to thank you all for joining us. This event gives us an opportunity to reflect on the changes in our world since September 11, 2001, and the ways in which the United States government has responded to these changes. Later this year, we will observe the 10th anniversary of the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. In response to these attacks, Congress created the Department of Homeland Security to be led by the Secretary, a member of the President's Cabinet. The creation of the Department united 22 agencies from across the executive branch, making it the largest reorganization of the federal government since President Harry Truman consolidated the armed forces into the Department of Defense. Last month, in her State of America's Homeland Security Address, Secretary Napolitano said, Real security requires the engagement of our entire society with government, law enforcement, the private sector, and the public, all playing their respective roles. The Department of Homeland Security was created to serve as the catalyst and the integrator of the nation's efforts to promote our general welfare. And our universities recognize the role that we play in this effort, whether in fostering public discourse through events like today's program, or by engaging in the kind of scholarship and research that can support the effort of our nation, or by educating the leaders of tomorrow who will contribute to these efforts. It's in that spirit that we come together today. And it's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's program, Andrea Mitchell, who will begin our program. Andrea is NBC News Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent and host of MSNBC's Andrea Mitchell Reports. She currently covers foreign policy, intelligence, and national security issues for all of the NBC News programs with a long and distinguished career as a correspondent here in Washington. It's my honor to welcome Andrea Mitchell. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, President DeJoya. Thank you, uh, Georgetown University, the School of Foreign Service, and this uh, beautiful campus, this historic building welcoming us all, and of course the co-sponsors, the Aspen Institute Homeland Security Program. So thanks to both for bringing us all together here today. I wanted to acknowledge them and of course Walter Isaacson, the head, the president of the Aspen Institute has been so key to all of this. And we have some key members of Congress here, Senator Mary Landrieu of the Homeland Security Subcommittee of Appropriations, and also David Price. Uh, the ranking member of Homeland Security, and Peter King, of course, the chairman of Homeland Security. Uh, welcome all and other members of Congress. John Pistol, the head of the TSA, is here in the audience. Congressman King, Chairman King, thank you all for coming. Um, 
let me know if I've missed anyone, but I wanted to get immediately to our three secretaries. I'm not sure whether all three of you have been together on a platform before uh, in testimony or another venue, but it's great to see you here today. And I was very struck by the fact that uh, Secretary Napolitano, who obviously is the third Secretary of Homeland Security and uh, as a former uh, governor of Arizona, has seen the challenges at every level of her national service in her second term. Of course, she became the third Secretary of Homeland Security, was a leader as governor on Homeland Security issues, was the first woman to chair the National Governors Association, and the first female Attorney General of Arizona. Uh, Michael Chertoff was the second Secretary of Homeland Security, uh, also previously was Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division at the Department of Justice, and of course was uh, a judge on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals before becoming Secretary of Homeland Security, and Tom Ridge, the former governor of Pennsylvania, the first Secretary of Homeland Security who became the first director of the office after nine, a month <coughs> after 9-11, uh, so perhaps had the most challenging job of all, elected to Congress back in 1982 and overwhelmingly re-elected five times, twice governor of Pennsylvania, and also the first congressman to have been an enlisted man in the Vietnam War and uh, has been awarded the Bronze Star among other commendations. But I was very struck, as I was saying, Secretary Napolitano, that you looked at your former colleagues, your predecessors, and you looked at how relaxed they appeared uh, while they were <laughs> sharing coffee and a few comments, and you said, this is a relief because there is a future after being <laughs> Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, I think the first question to you is, what keeps you up at night? What is the greatest fear? Uh, that we face as a nation and that you face in your job? Is it Alawaki? Is it bin Laden? Is it the fact that 28 people were killed last weekend alone along the Mexican border, uh, on the long uh, range of that Mexican border as uh, part of the ongoing drug war, which some say is really the most frightening of the challenges facing the homeland right now? So what is it that really faces you, and I just want to acknowledge, of course, the outgoing uh, longtime Homeland Security Specialist, Congresswoman Jane Harmon, who has joined us and is sitting next, <laughs> next to Walter. Secretary Napolitano, well, the, the think, greatest threat facing our borders. Well, I'm interested to hear from, from uh, Tom and, and uh, uh, Michael, but I think um, I could say all of the above. Uh, because all of them uh, touch upon key roles of the Department of Homeland Security. Um, Alalaki, for example, one of the uh, key uh, espousers or inspirers, if I can use that word, of terrorist activity uh, in the English-speaking world. Uh, bin Laden, still at large, uh, and uh, while core al-Qaeda has been constrained uh, to a large degree in terms of its geography. Uh, it still uh, itself uh, has served as, um, uh, as a core, and there are now many other al-Qaeda-related uh, or type organizations around the world that seek to harm the West and uh, seek to harm the United States. And the border with Mexico is uh, something uh, that we um, focus on quite a bit um, it's an area where uh, we are assisting President Calderon in his very valiant war against these uh, large and powerful drug cartels that exist over the bridge from uh, El Paso, uh, over the road from uh, Laredo, uh, across uh, basically a, a huge gully in Nogales. So um, uh, that's a, a key uh, struggle for us or a, a key issue that we have. So. Um, I think part of what makes Homeland Security such a complex um, and challenging position is that um, you can, it's almost easier to say what you don't worry about than what you need to be worried about at any given time. Secretary Chertoff, how has it changed since your tenure in terms of perhaps international cooperation? and the focus on cargo and some of the other more recent threats that we saw? Well, you know, I, I would say that um, what uh, Janet has said it pretty much uh, approximates the kinds of things that we were concerned about when I was secretary going back a couple of years. 
Um, I think there has been some evolution. Um, uh, four or five years ago, I would have said core al-Qaeda in uh, Pakistan was the area of greatest threat. Now we have al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. That's al-Awlaki in Yemen. We have al-Qaeda in the Maghreb is becoming an increasing problem. Uh, so we're beginning to see this, this issue spread out more. Um, I also think if you look at what's going on in Mexico, that is um, becoming more and more troubling, uh, partly, frankly, as a consequence of President Calderon having been, I would say, heroic in pursuing the drug cartels, but they are, they are pushing back. So I, I, what we're seeing is a much more widely distributed threat than might have been the case four or five years ago. And then maybe the most notable is homegrown terrorism as we succeeded with the help of our international partners in making it more difficult for people to come into the United States to carry out operations. Uh, what we've seen now is a greater emphasis on recruiting Americans or, or uh, residents in the U.S. to become operatives, and I think that is challenging the model that we use for security. Secretary Ridge, the Homeland Security Department was created eight years ago today, which is uh, really the precipitator for us getting together today. Do you think that this combination, this hybrid creation, has been an effective, uh, an effective tool? A lot of people have complained about the intelligence reorganization and that, in fact, by layering, we have created more stove types, not fewer, and that the real mandate of the 9-11 Commission has not worked. But in the case of Homeland Security, with, despite all the complaints, uh, looking back, do you think that this has come together into a coherent agency? I think the, uh, uh, we have to go back and take a snapshot of uh, what the government looked like right after 9-11. And uh, clearly, uh, both the executive branch and Congress were struggling with what's the best way to recalibrate and uh, reconstitute uh, some very capable people and organizations, but to create a border-centric agency. And the challenge around that was that there were uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of discussions as to what, and what was appropriate to put in the agency. And since that time, the one agency, the one component that people still have some difficulty with is FEMA, although I'm a strong believer that the Federal Emergency Management Agency is exactly where it belongs. Some of the challenges associated, I believe, have had more to deal with leadership than the organization itself. So I think the configuration of those uh, entities within the department uh, was very appropriate. Uh, but it's uh, one of the things we discussed uh, before we came uh, out on this stage is how everything is evolving from that space. Uh, remember, uh, they reorganized the Department of Defense after World War II. Uh, we were building this new agency at the same time we were trying to build the defensive mechanisms to make America more secure. And so I started, Mike followed, Secretary Napolitano still trying to do all the business line integration. There were the IT, the personnel, so the, uh, the budgeting. And you're still trying to, to make it a more efficient organization internally. If you can be more efficient Internally, you can be more effective externally. So that's an ongoing process. You play defense, and I guess the lingering challenge that the agency still has, uh, and there's, we all probably have, may have different opinions as to what the real risk is today, although that has evolved as well, as Michael pointed out. I mean, remember the profile of the terrorists as we knew it right after 9-11? Uh, males from the Arabian Peninsula, 18 to 35. Well, that's really changed. Uh, and we, we understand that. But the biggest challenge I think the agency still has, and I remind everybody every chance I get, the agency, to your point, Andrea, is a consumer of information. It doesn't generate intelligence. All three of us have said everybody has a role to play in Homeland Security. Everybody. All 307 million citizens. But the agency can only act based on the information it is given. And I still think eight years later, uh, one of the big challenges is making sure that the Department of Homeland Security has enough information so that it can share with our partners, either in the private sector or states and local governments. I still think, uh, from my perspective, that's still a bit of a challenge. How much is it luck, Secretary Napolitano, and how much is it skill and you know, government intelligence gathering? Because... We have not had an attack since 9-11, yet the, the Christmas Day bomber in 2009 basically was passengers being alert. 
Faisal Shahzad in Times Square was a vendor, a street vendor. Um, the cargo being intercepted and the, um, on, on the, in terms of the, the printers had to do with Saudi intelligence tipping us off. I guess the most recent example in Texas might be the best example of Homeland working the way it was intended with a shipper notifying official, local officials in Lubbock. Um, let me ask you to elaborate on that. Well, I think what we have, um, what, what I have actually concluded is that uh, the notion that intelligence is simply kind of linear and that you simply connect the dots is, is not accurate. What happens now is there's lots and lots and lots of information, uh, a cloud, so to speak, and uh, you have to be able to discern patterns in that cloud uh, uh, and to identify threats. Um, and you have to have multiple layers and uh, multiple layers of our society who recognize a threat um, and pass it on. Uh, so uh, you have, uh, on, the, on the Christmas Day bomber, um, a flight, it was the passengers who uh, obviously uh, uh, took, took uh, Abdul Muttalib down. Uh, and we have done now a number of things in, uh, in response to that to uh, tighten up on uh, airline security, and we're still doing a, a lot in that area. It remains a key concern. Um, uh, when you talk about Faisal Shahzad, what a great example of citizen involvement. Uh, a street vendor sees smoke coming from a vehicle he doesn't recognize as normally being by the place where uh, he sells uh, hot dogs or whatever, uh, immediately notifies law enforcement, and uh, we go from that cold, that notice in 53 hours to the apprehension of uh, Shazad. Uh, and then with respect to uh, the student in Texas, um, I don't want to comment too much because it's still a pending uh, matter, but again, an illustration of how uh, when citizens are involved and when you have opened the doors and said this is not just a government responsibility, it's a joint responsibility to share information, to recognize threats, uh, then, then we're starting to create that kind of homeland security architecture uh, that, that Tom started, that Michael built on, and that we are furthering. When we look at the threats, Michael Chertoff, and we all think about airplane threats, what about something that you seem to, min to minimize, uh, notably when you suggested that you know an airplane th flight could kill 3,000 people if a bomb, you know, as we know, went into the buildings. But a bomb in a subway may kill only 30 people. You have to start thinking about priorities, you suggested. And that created some controversy. Have we ignored subways, tunnels, um, Amtrak, because of the, the focus on airplane security? Well, I, you know, I, I, would, I would say two things. First, at a general level, this is about risk management. It is not about risk elimination. Uh, if you want somebody to tell you that the government or anybody is going to eliminate all the risk in life, then you're asking for someone to give you a fantasy. Um, and that you do have to prioritize. You're going to see this now with the budget. There's going to have to be uh, judgments made about where you put the money. So what you look at is you do look at potential Im impact, and you recognize that a catastrophic impact that could kill tens of thousands of people gets more <clears throat> investment than something that would be tragic but might only kill 10 people. And I know it's not fashionable to make that distinction in numbers, but realistically, as a policymaker, you have to look at that difference. I would also say, though, that um, you know the architecture of the response is different. For example, I, I would say we have actually done quite a bit over the years in building security in the railway system. You know, we have these um, joint teams called Viper teams, which we put out into the subways, we put out into the train stations. I know it's continued under uh, uh, Janet uh, Napolitano. And uh, it's not the same fixed architecture you see at the airport because you can't have magnetometers at every subway station, but it is risk management using uh, various kinds of tools, people, technology, even canines. So you've got to use different <clears throat> types of methods for different kinds of threats. The one thing I, I just want to add uh, to follow up on the point that Janet made earlier uh, is what I call about layered defense. And I think Tom originally talked about layered defense, and we've all talked about it. And what that means is that there is no magic 
solution to Homeland Security. Uh, it's not going to be perfectly addressed by intelligence. It's not going to be perfectly addressed by technology. You have to build a system that has multiple layers so that if one fails, another one can, can pick up the job. And you also have to recognize that human error is a part of a system, and that's why multiple layer defense allows you to overcome human error. So uh, this is a, pr a process and a system. It is not a single solution. Following up on that, when you talk about layers, Secretary Ridge, we had Richard Reed, so we take off our shoes. Then we had the liquid, so now we can't carry our shampoo bottles. It seems as though we keep building layers, and when do we reach a point where we, first of all, are not keeping one step ahead of the terrorists, but secondly, you know, is there a, should there be an attempt to look at previous threats and perhaps um, figure out that we don't need all of the things that are now built into the system? Well, first of all, uh, I think that uh, now that I'm flying quite a bit, uh, number one, I do what it feels like and, to and have been, pardon me? Us. What does it feel like to be just one of us again? Uh, <laughs> I get a chance to see some great people working at TSA. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, with, with the new machines, I must tell you, with the, that, that come out, I saw one, uh, uh, one poor TSA official absolutely getting lambasted by a very, very, very unhappy uh, commercial passenger. And he was very cool, calm, and collected, and he took all the grief coming his way. And I went over to him, and I said, you know, that was a, a great uh, lesson in patience and, and customer care. I said, do yourself a favor, and I say this respectfully to my friends in Congress. Uh, the next time somebody says that, say, write your congressman. I, I'm just doing what I have been advised and instructed to do based on directions from the Congress. So uh, more seriously, one of the big challenges, I think, with uh, commercial aviation uh, is that and we've talked about this internally as well, uh, we're not quite to a risk-managed stage yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I guess the question becomes in our own mind, as a country, uh, do we want to treat everyone as a potential terrorist forever and ever? And I think that goes to the heart of your question. We have layered in multiple uh, checks there, and I do agree with my colleagues that you never want a single point of failure. The first point of failure would be if you don't have intelligence about the potential actor, because that's ideally what Homeland Security is about. You want to get the actor before they act. But presuming that doesn't happen, then what do you do on commercial aviation? Well, we build in these systems. Uh, I still think uh, down the road, hopefully with the support of Congress, they'll take a more risk-managed approach. Uh, I've asked many, many audiences, and we tried it, and then it worked. Uh, people prepared to give up uh, their iris scans for identity fingerprints to match against the base volunteer information so that in a risk-managed world, we could conclude you're probably not a terrorist. Now, there's no 100 percent guarantee. So I think in time, this, is going, this still has to evolve. One final matter, and, and I, this, this really is an irritant, and perhaps it shouldn't be, but I think President Kennedy in 62 said we're going to the moon. We got to the moon in 69. That's seven years. It's 10 years after 9-11. We still haven't figured out to get the right piece of technology at our airports. So apparently it's easier to go to the moon than come up with a piece of technology that could be a little bit uh, less invasive and give John Pistol and TSA different sets of equipment to work with. So I think we still have a lot of work to do there. I think Congress wants to move there, but that's one area where we haven't quite learned how to manage the risk, and I certainly hope in the next couple of years we do. This opens up a, a number of questions, uh, first to you, Secretary Napolitano, about the technology. What would be wrong with, with uh, advancing on two fronts, biometrics and some sort of a, a staggered passenger list, uh, as well as incorporating some of the techniques, and I think you already are, that the Israelis and others use in terms of profiling? Well, we don't. Um, uh, let me. Uh, well, and we don't profile. Um, but what we do do is we do use a lot of intelligence. Uh, uh, that's uh, intelligence about passengers before they even get to the airport. Uh, uh, that's been uh, part of a, a process uh, um, that uh, uh, actually uh, began under, I think really under you, Michael, but we have really accelerated uh, now. So there is intel about uh, passengers as they come in. And then uh, within the airport itself, you'll see... Uh, you'll see some uniformed officers. You'll see canines. You'll see some persons carrying explosive trace detection 
uh, equipment or you'll come across uh, them. Uh, you won't see others. Uh, you won't see, for example, behavior detection officers um, who do use uh, uh, some uh, techniques to look at tactics. They're trained in tactics and techniques of someone uh, who may be actually anticipating uh, an attack. So by the time you get to that checkpoint, um, there have already been four or five layers uh, in advance of you. Um, now, the problem is, as, as Tom correctly notes, is we, we don't have the checkpoint of the future yet, an integrated checkpoint um, that would enable you to leave your shoes on, uh, carry your water bottle, not have to unload your laptop from your briefcase or your, or your backpack. Um, and that technology just uh, isn't there. Um, uh, so we fund research uh, primarily at universities uh, to help us uh, identify those technologies that would give us uh, that, that um, ability, um, also with our national labs. Now, some of that research is um, uh, at issue as we go through the budget uh, process right now. Uh, research and development overall across the federal government has been cut back dramatically uh, uh, in the uh, House uh, budget as it currently stands. So uh, that's something that Congress uh, will want to will take a look at. This research, this kind of research has direct capability. I want to follow up on one point Mike said, though. It, um, one of the reasons we do all of this in aviation is because there is a connect to current intelligence about the desire to attack aviation, uh, uh, either by uh, getting an explosive on a cargo plane or on a passenger plane. And it doesn't really matter which is which, although I think uh, our adversaries would prefer a passenger plane. But uh, one of the reasons we do this is because it's a current threat. With respect to uh, subways and trains, uh, uh, we have uh, that threat as well, um, not necessarily uh, as uh, obvious or as uh, frequently articulated as the threat against aviation, uh, but the president's budget includes uh, monies for 12 more Viper teams uh, because they are very useful, um, multi, uh, they have multiple different uh, parts to them, but uh, they are able to help us secure some of these surface transportation nodes that we have. What about the TSA? Michael Chertoff. Uh, Administrator Pistol is <laughs> sitting there and Sorry, sort of John. In his right. head. But I mean, that is the face of Homeland to so many people. You know, uh, we're talking about, first of all, unionization, I believe, of TSA. And that is one of the issues right now. Um, the car some of the cargo uh, checks are subcontracted out. How would you, and uh, now as an expert, but an outsider who, with, with the past experience, evaluate oh, how yeah. TSA is? You know, like Tom, I now have the opportunity to travel uh, quite a bit by air, and um, How's that working for you? it's actually worked fine for me. Um, <clears throat> and partly because I actually plan ahead, and I kind of know what the rules are, and so I get myself organized to go through yeah. <laughs> efficiently. Um, and yes. um, but I have to say, I mean, I watch, um, I watch carefully to see what. Uh, other people's experiences are. And I have to say the vast majority of people I see go through the checkpoints, do, um, I think, you know, cooperate with the, the uh, officers. And I think the officers really try to be helpful. It's a very challenging job. I think the thing that is difficult for people under, under, to understand is you're talking about millions of people who go through the checkpoints. And uh, it is an area where the government interfaces with the public maybe more than anything else, except tax time with IRS. Uh, clearly, everybody would like to have a technological solution. Um, the challenge has always been throughput. Uh, if you, for example, want to have a machine that looks at liquids, if it takes 30 seconds per bottle, uh, the line would be nine hours long. Uh, another panacea I often hear talked about is, as Janet talked about a little bit, what the Israelis do. Um, and we do have a system of behavioral detection which works. But remember, the Israelis have one airport. They have a handful of flights compared to what we have. It's just a different architecture. So uh, I, I'm quite sure that the current administration, just as ours, is very intent on developing the technology that will make this easier, as well as the other tools, but recognize that it is a triumph that we have not had a hijacking or a bomb go off in an airplane since September 11th in this country. And it is not for want of trying. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, one of the things that um, John Pistol could tell you, as his predecessor could tell you, 
is uh, you'd be amazed at the amount of things that are picked up at the checkpoints that could be components of bombs. I remember yeah. there was one case a couple of years ago where someone had wires in a, in a big piece of cheese. And it may sound funny, but actually that's how you test the system. You don't put the bomb on. You put something benign, but you look to see whether wires or metal can be smuggled through the system. So it is a very challenging uh, environment, but they've been successful up to now. Yeah. I just wanted to add one Please. thing with regard to TSA, too. They, from time to time, a very enterprising journalist will uh, try to tweak the system and then have some nightly news report. No one here. Uh, no, 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 nobody covering this uh, event today, I'm sure. But I, I, I want the public to be reassured that, number one, uh, everybody understands that they're not perfect, but they go to work every day trying to do the best they can. But believe me, TSA tests themselves on a regular basis. They're constantly probing their own defenses. And to, to the extent my colleague said, that you build in a redundant layer of security. And, uh, and they, they test it themselves all the time. So, uh, yes, there's some inconvenience associated with it. I mean, I've been pulled aside for secondary screening over two dozen times. Uh, maybe I, there's some profile out there I don't understand, but that's just the way it goes. I get a chance to say hello to some of the good people doing the best things they can. They're doing the very best that they can. Uh, but they do test the system themselves, and I think you need to know that. They're not complacent. They're not sitting back waiting for something to happen. Uh, they kind of red cell themselves and try to probe and test, and even th and the things they discover, they apply later on, and you don't even know about it. Uh, how, how much progress are we making with the European Union, Secretary Napolitano, on <coughs> getting some sort of a uniform standard so that we know that these incoming flights have been vetted to our satisfaction? Uh, actually, uh, very, this is, uh, uh, the, the jargon is API, PNR, but what those initials stand for is the process by which uh, we share in advance of people boarding flights, uh, uh, who they are, what have you, so those names can be run against um, a number of different databases uh, uh, that we have. Uh, so that we, we even know before somebody gets on a flight or is allowed to get on a flight what we're dealing with. And uh, the European uh, Union, uh, which operates now under something called the Lisbon Treaty, which is um, new since both of you were secretary, um, uh, is in negotiations with the United States on one EU-wide API PNR agreement with the United States. And we're proceeding. Uh, we're uh, actually this week begins, I think, now the third round of negotiations. Uh, and we are, I think, getting there to a common understanding of uh, what, what a good agreement would uh, require. And again, uh, we need to do it in such a fashion that real time information is exchanged. Uh, it's exchanged in a format that we can run because, as Michael said, we're talking about millions of passengers uh, a day. I mean, this is a uh, we are the busiest uh, flight area in the world by a large margin. Um, uh, so we need it real time, common format. Uh, but we also need to manage the data in such a fashion that uh, concerns about uh, privacy are addressed. And what does making progress mean in terms of real time getting an agreement? Well, we have, we, we get, we, we have, um, there is actually now an existing uh, agreement. Um, what we're r doing now is renegotiating it uh, to make it even better. Uh, and when we say real time, we mean um, uh, by, by the time a passenger places an order uh, for a ticket, uh, information is, is exchanged. Yeah, can I just make a Please. point here? But it's very interesting to have the three of us on stage because there's an, this has been an, uh, an evolutionary process. Uh, to the credit of it, it's not an R or D. You start with a foundation and you build on things. Uh, when I was in the White House and then the first couple of months as secretary, we began the discussions with the European Union. We wanted that advanced passenger information. It, it took well over a year to get it, but we didn't get it until the plane was in the air. But at least we got the information. You probably remember, some of the students are too young to remember, but we turned a famous artist around by the name of Cat Stevens that day. And uh, what you did know, that same day, we, there were a couple other people we took off the plane and sent back to Europe. That was the first step. Secretary Chertoff said, well, that's nice. Uh, we begin to develop that relationship. But he said, thanks for giving it to us after the plane is airborne. 
but why don't you give it to us before the plane's airborne so we don't have to land them in Bangor, Maine, and send them back? So he successfully negotiated that and some other things with that. Now Secretary Napolitano takes it to the next step. So there's a lot of things that have evolved from that, from that basic, let's gobble these things together, start working. I mean, the threat warning system, I knew that's going to come up one of these days, uh, which, very, which is very appropriate. The color, code. the color coded system, uh, that's 3.0. Uh, the first thing that happened was when then General Ashcroft and uh, Bob Mueller and Tom Ridge would just have a press conference and say, uh, the threat tomorrow is greater than it is today. Uh, be alert, be aware, have a good day, and walk off the stadium. <laughs> Not terribly effective. Uh, the second was a threat warning system, the much maligned, five-color-coded system that was designed. In public communication, the three of us will tell you one of the most important things that, that the department can do. Uh, it was designed to tell the public that the President's Homeland Security Council said the threat is greater. There was a consensus that had to be reached, but it was also designed to tell people specifically what you should do. That was 2.0. Secretary Napolitano, with her revision, has taken it to 3.0. So all along the way, you see things that began five, six, seven, now eight years ago. Every secretary, regardless of party, has tried to improve upon, build, and I think that's... Uh, a credit to the men and women who work there because we're there for eight years and then but everybody understand it's an evolutionary process and I think it's been fairly positive. Now, one thing that hasn't changed in eight years is that you still have projects across the country uh, rather than the focus of the money primarily being in the, the greatest threat areas. What do we do about, you know, with all the talk about earmarks and pork barrel legislation, there still is a lot that is distributed across congressional districts. I want to ask you about that because Janet Napolitano still has her budget at stake. And three hearings yeah. this week. She's yeah. got three budget hearings. I, I have the luxury of not having to go and testify about budget. Um, I actually have to say, I think over, over time, um, this became much improved and there still remain urban legends about uh, distributions of money that occurred in the first or second round uh, th that I don't think reflect the reality. My, my, as of the time I left, and I think it's still true, most of the money in the president's budget now, you know, Congress sometimes changes that, as you know, uh, was dedicated to the higher risk areas. Um, so New York got the most money. Los Angeles got a lot of money. We had tiers of cities, for example, uh, and generally speaking, um, we didn't actually get a lot of earmarking compared certainly to the kinds of things you see at the Department of Defense. So I think that, um, you know, it, it has been, a, again, an evolutionary process to build a common sense system for allocating the money uh, in a way that is, um, you know, more or less reasonable. Now, I do have to, you know, be fair, and I, probably the current secretary can't say this, there are times that members of Congress have a different idea of what the risks are than the president's uh, budget has. And so uh, the administration may never be 100 percent happy with what comes out. But I think it has improved over time. Um, what, getting back to the, to the issue of al Qaeda, is al Qaeda central no longer the central threat, the, the chief threat that it was because of whatever we've been able to accomplish through drones and other, other um, technologies? Are we now talking about al Awlaki or other splinter groups? Uh, and especially as we see all of this revolutionary change in the region, are we now facing a greater challenge because uh, we no longer have central governments, relationships, intelligence relationships that we've had for many years with Egypt and others? Um, and now have to figure out what this new world is going to look like? Well, um, I think one of the evolutions we have seen is in al-Qaeda itself. Um, and, um, uh, you know, what, whereas 9-11 uh, 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 was a core al-Qaeda activity, and that was the genesis of the reason for the department, um, that attack, um, uh, core al-Qaeda uh, has been constrained by a number of the activities that have gone on and, and uh, largely confined to that area between Afghanistan and, and Pakistan. Although uh, modern communications being what they are, you know, they, you know, things still come out of there that can be used to uh, inspire, uh, to institute, to uh, uh, um, let people know we're still here and this is, you know, the West is still uh, uh, the enemy, uh, and that's that's where you should focus your attention. Uh, 
Uh, but we now have um, uh, AQAP, as Michael said, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. Uh, you have Al-Shabaab uh, in uh, Somalia, uh, another uh, group. So you have these groups all, all over the world. And then the evolution I have seen uh, really accelerate in my two years uh, has been the so-called homegrowns. Uh, uh, those uh, U.S. persons who, for whatever reason, and, and, we, and we don't have a good understanding about what causes someone to do this, uh, but they become uh, themselves inspired to uh, commit jihad. They may travel abroad to get training and then come back, um, but uh, that's a, a key, um, key concern for us uh, moving forward. That's why it's so important that we uh, have a security architecture that recognizes that everybody has a role. Uh, that's uh, one of the reasons why we um, are taking national to see something, say something, uh, campaign. It's to kind of get across to uh, citizens at large that everybody has a, a, a place uh, place in our security. That's why we've really uh, tried to work more closely with the private sector and what they are doing to protect uh, security. Because it's not as easy, if it, it's not just one group in one place using one methodology. It's uh, many different groups dispersed and some uh, individuals and, and small groups, even within our own country, using lots of different methodologies. So it's, it's, a, it's a, uh, everything in this area evolves. Um, to speak to the, the point about, um, you know, what's currently going on in the Middle East, which, of course, is, I think, commanding a lot of attention. And I'm tempted, you know, when people say, well, how do you feel about all the ac um, energy and activities there, I'm tempted to be reminded of Joe and Lai's remark when he was asked about the French Revolution. He said it's too soon to tell how it turns out. Um, things are very much unfolding. On the positive side, uh, for the first time, there's an alternative narrative for uh, progress in the Middle East uh, that is in, in dramatic distinction from that drawn by al-Qaeda. It's a narrative of democracy and freedom, and that's a very positive model. On the other hand, we don't know how it's going to play out because as regimes topple, there'll be a need to have a new government come in that is capable of delivering services to the people. And, you know, at some point the garbage has to be picked up and jobs have to be created. And if those new governments are not capable of doing that, then the opportunities will arise either for the military to come back in or perhaps to have extremists come in. So this is a, an example of an area where uh, the verdict is very much out. I mean, there's real cause for optimism, but also cause for, for careful watching and waiting. And this is going to have an impact, as, as Janet said, on our security architecture. Yeah. Well, in fact, Secretary Ridge, what we're seeing in Libya, many say, is an evolution or a devolution, which was, is going to be more like Somalia, uh, a failed state, that there is no central core likely to replace Gaddafi should he be ousted from power. Well, I think what we've seen over the Middle East is, uh, you know, the a repressive autocracy, no matter how they got there, uh, those days are numbered probably globally. Uh, but because of the absence of any institutions of civil society, I mean, there's, you take a look at Egypt and you say, what are, what are the instruments of self-government that exist in Egypt today that, that uh, they can build upon? There aren't any. In Libya, there aren't any. Um, and, and pretty much around the Middle East. It'll take a while, and nature abhors a vacuum, and so does politics. And one of the great concerns that I have taking a look at that region right now is the growing influence of Iran. It is uh, by far the number one uh, terrorist provocateur in terms of financing, political support, arms and munitions throughout the Middle East. I mean, you take a look at the, the potential influence in Iran, uh, two-thirds of Shia, you've got to believe they're stirring the pot. Uh, you take a look at their, their support of uh, Hezbollah and what has happened in uh, Lebanon, the support uh, with Syria, uh, the, Islam the uh, Palestinian uh, Islamic Jihad. Uh, you take a look at in, in uh, Egypt, uh, the Islamic Brotherhood, they have all of those tentacles into Iran. And so I think my colleagues are, uh, couldn't agree with them more. There is so much uncertainty. And while we want to think optimistically about what can happen, uh, one of the obstacles, I think, to the outcome we would all like to see will be the growing impact and influence of Iran. And uh, pretty clear that uh, negotiating with them hasn't worked and sanctions hasn't worked. And as the influence of our influence is diminished in the region 
and the Western world's influence is diminished in the region, uh, there's a vacuum. And uh, they're beginning to fill it, and I think we ought to be really concerned about that, because while it may not result in direct attacks uh, on the United States, clearly unrest in the Middle East, uh, we worry about our ally Israel, and just generally what will happen to the, the, the world's economy generally if some of these uh, vacuums are filled by additional repressive uh, uh, leadership and the impact that has is, I think, is serious consequences for the United States. We have to be mindful of that. It is, an, it is a terrorist state. They're promoting terrorism within the region. If that spills over, too difficult to uh, discern at the present time. But I think Iran is a, a major, major problem over there, and we've got to pay more attention to it. Secretary Napolitano, let's talk about immigration for a moment. Um, what is the nexus between illegal immigration and terrorism, if any? Well, I think um, uh, right now, you know, the, the, the question often raised is if, if somebody can sneak across uh, the border, what prevents a terrorist from getting across the border? And the United States, unique among nations, has these two huge land uh, borders, and it is uh, physically and fiscally impossible to have a Border Patrol agent just sitting every 100 yards or so along uh, each of those borders. Um, and so when you're talking about uh, risk management, as Michael said, when you're talking about controlling our borders uh, and, and you're talking about terrorism, one of the things you have to have is good intelligence. Um, you have to be able to identify before you even get to the borders of the United States um, who may be transiting either through Mexico or uh, Canada or uh, through the air uh, trying to get into our country. Uh, and then with respect to our borders uh, themselves, uh, we need to understand that we are never going to be in a, a position to seal those borders. Too much legal traffic needs to be able to flow back and forth. That's, they're our number one and two trading partners. Uh, uh, and so um, uh, what we have to do is have border management uh, that has good, effective ports of entry uh, where uh, somebody coming through, if they're trying to use somebody else's identity or something like that, uh, that, that can be pinged in the system and immediately picked up and then uh, control as much as possible what goes on between those ports. How good is the intelligence? You know, I think the intelligence is good, but like any other intelligence, as, as Janet said earlier, it's not perfect. Um, and the idea that there's a capability to pinpoint every single threat, uh, even at the granular level, is not, not realistic. That's kind of the, the kind of thing you see on television. Um, that's why it's an issue of layers, and it's an issue of having the intelligence about who comes in, but putting the assets on the border that give you a reasonable chance of, of intercepting and apprehending. And, and the truth is, it has worked. I mean, there has been, over the last several years, a drop in the number of people who come into the country illegally between the ports of entry. Some of that is attributable to the economy, but frankly, some of it is attributable to enforcement. I remember uh, four or five years ago, uh, I was out in Yuma sector in Arizona. You remember that. You were governor. And uh, there were literally hundreds of thousands of people would run across the border every day. And because the distance between the border and the town of Yuma was a very short distance, once they got into town, they would blend into the town. It would be difficult to apprehend them. <clears throat> so we put up fencing, um, which some people don't like, but we put up fencing, we put up uh, technology, we added border patrol, and that number dropped dramatically to literally a handful a day. So you can, depending on where you are in the border, use a series of tools in order to uh, minimize the flow. Is it going to be an absolute seal? No. But will it, again, manage the risk in, in conjunction with these other tools? Yes, it will. But isn't it true that most illegal immigration really has to do with economic issues, with people coming, no, driven by Yeah, no uh, question. No question. Most people who come across the border are not coming across to do harm to the U.S. They're coming across to work at jobs that uh, either Americans don't want to work or the wage isn't, isn't attractive. Um, and that's why uh, in 2007, you know, we spent a lot of time trying to do a comprehensive immigration reform, which came close, I think, to passing the Senate. It didn't quite make it. But in the end, it looked at putting a lot of border and, and enforcement resources in, but also coming up with a temporary worker program and dealing with the illegal migrants who are in the country already. Mike? 
I just want to add on, I, I, I do hope that sometime in the future that we do end up looking at our immigration policy generally. It's great to talk about defense, we do, enforcement we do, but at the end of the day, the demographics in the United States uh, suggest that uh, we will need additional labor going back and forth across the border in a lawful way. So a comprehensive approach, and Secretary Chertoff tried, uh, and they came very, very close. And I know it's the third rail of contemporary politics right now. Uh, but at the end of the day, there are a couple of things that I would suggest to my, in, this, in this debate. Don't think that everybody that comes across the border wants to be an American citizen. I don't think we should be that arrogant. A lot of them would just love to come up here, work lawfully, and go back home. I think we need to understand that. I think we could use biometrics, as I think that part of your plan was the biometrics. And so at some point in time, uh, building a database that employers can lawfully use and be protected from any potential sanctions, strong enforcement after, after businesses that go after uh, who hire people outside that, uh, that basic system, more, more enforcement, more technology. But at, at some point in time, I just hope that the uh, Congress accepts the responsibility, and I can say this because I was there for 12 years and voted for amnesty under Ronald Reagan, at some point in time, you've got to say to yourself, we're not sending 12 million people home. And let's get over it. You could identify them, you're not going to send them home, so let's just figure out a way to legitimize their status, create a new system, and I think uh, that will add more to border security than any number of fences we can put across the southern border. Sure. My opinion. Well, as it two-term member and uh, long-term member of Congress as well, and elected as a Republican, how do you persuade people like the governor of Arizona and other you know, leading Republican voices to well, take another look at this? But I, and, I, and again, I'm, uh, two of us are governors. I have a certain amount of empathy for uh, the, all governors who are trying to deal with this issue. Uh, I think that issue slowly fades from... Uh, the portfolio of concerns by governors if the federal government has a holistic, comprehensive solution. I think it addresses many of the problems that the governors are trying to confront. You know, in a funny way, the budget issue we're facing now may, may be an interesting impetus because um, it will constrain even on the ability uh, to put increased investment on enforcement. And, and I think what, one thing that people are beginning to realize now is, which I think those of us who've had executive jobs have, have known, is you have, they are hard choices, and you do have to make decisions that are not perfect in order to get things done and in order to make alleviate situations. And it may be that as part of the spirit of dealing with some of the budget challenges we face, there will be a recognition that we're going to have to come up with a solution that takes account of both the need to be, uh, do enforcement but also to deal with the immigration system overall and to be comprehensive about it. In fact, I'm going to bring in a moment, as we bring the audience in to ask questions, some of our members of Congress here, because in this interaction, um, you can say, having left office, that it's not going to be perfect. But if you're Janet Napolitano and you make some sort of risk-benefit analysis and decide what you can spend and what you can't spend, or if there's an appropriation that gets killed and there, something gets across and something happens and there's another attack, she's going to be the one sitting and facing a congressional hearing. Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> because of the, the and job then, description. And, and I'm going to bring Michael and Tom and, <laughs> and explain uh, risk management. But, uh, you know, that's you know, part, you know, part of the responsibility that each of us has undertaken is to lead this... Uh, department to help build this department to bring it together, um, and I think uh, each of us uh, acknowledges the the risk we take uh, in in accepting that position. Uh, and and I think uh, if you make a decision and it turns out uh, badly, in, a, in other words, something that um, uh, you thought would not happen actually does. Um, and it may be nobody even made a mistake. It may be just one of these things that, that happens. Um, uh, but I think if you can uh, demonstrate to the public uh, and, and the public uh, through the Congress or the public at large uh, why you did what you did and, and uh, what the reasons for it uh, were, um, I, I believe that uh, the public itself has matured and is maturing in its recognition of what uh, security is and uh, what uh, risks are. And so 
Um, I would hope that you could have that kind of uh, uh, a dialogue. But uh, uh, again, when you lead the Department of Homeland Security, uh, you're sitting on the edge of your chair quite a bit of the time. And I wanted to just uh, button this down with one other issue out there, risk or not. It's the role of the media. Uh, when you have stories hammering home every day during the Christmas travel season about the invasive technologies and you know, interviewing people randomly at airports about their grievances, you know, how do we balance what we do and uh, either help or hurt? I mean, it's not our role to be a partner of yours, but there are times when we um, sit on information at the request of government agencies. We, most recently, that happened in Pakistan. Um, but with, with the incident in Pakistan and involving all of us, uh, what is the appropriate advers healthy adversarial relationship uh, that also does not get in the way of national security? Well, I think um, it's, it's a, this is a daily struggle um, because the, the media is there to cover news, and um, oftentimes uh, you are in possession of uh, information the media doesn't have and you cannot share. Uh, and that means you cannot share it with the public, and uh, th that's one of the <laughs> one of the parts of, uh, of the job. Um, one of the frustrating things about the media, however, um, uh, present company excluded, um, is you can, you can, you can uh, uh, no, but is is the need to, you need to cover something twenty four seven, and and uh, that means you the easiest thing to cover is uh, conflict. Um, uh, and so there's a, a constant um, drumbeat to kind of uh, uh, pick a fight uh, or uh, say, well, that person said this. How do you respond to that? Uh, you know, that sort of uh, dynamic. Um, as opposed to, uh, from our standpoint, the key function of the media is to help us get information out uh, to people, particularly when something has uh, happened and people have been injured or uh, killed. Uh, what happened, why, what's the risk to them, what do they need to know? Um, or if there's something about to happen, this is particularly true, for example, in the, in the FEMA situation where we have, uh, you know, those responsibilities. So, we, you know, every morning um, as part of my daily brief, I get, the, you know, the upcoming weather. Uh, I never paid so much attention to the weather that I do as, as Secretary of Homeland Security, and you have to uh, because uh, you have to be alert to areas of the country that, uh, may be subject uh, uh, right now. We just finished some major winter storms. We're looking at flooding in the uh, Red River uh, area. There are forest fires going on in Texas. Uh, and you have to know all those things so you make sure that we are reaching out to governors and mayors, uh, to uh, local uh, emergency ops centers and so forth, and they have all the resources they need to, to, deal, to deal with that. And the media can be a great partner. Uh, when you're trying to get information uh, to people. And so that's how we'd like to, that's not how media sees itself, but in the kinds of things we deal with, it's, it's how we would like the media to be. And with that, I'd like to uh, bring the audience in. First of all, uh, also acknowledge um, the help of the uh, Homeland Security Forum, William Laurie, and also Ed Cash, who helped bring all of this together. Our thanks to you as well, of course, is to Aspen and to Georgetown. And in the audience, as I say, we have a wealth of knowledge here, uh, particularly, first of all, and foremost, from members of Congress. Uh, we have microphones and I think also hand mics. So um, we have Senator Landrieu here and Congressman King, Congressman Price, uh, Congresswoman Harmon. Uh, Senator Landrieu, do you have a, a question? Well, it would be a great segue based on the last part of the conversation or exchange to ask my question, so I'll take this opportunity, and I thank all of you for being here and being so um, forth forthcoming in your thoughts and comments. Six and a half years ago, 1,800 people were killed in a catastrophic infrastructure failing when the federal levy system in New Orleans that holds out water around a great city virtually collapsed. And not much has been talked about this morning about an important part of the department, which is FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. So I'd like to ask the secretary now serving, 
What are your thoughts about how FEMA has improved? And then I'd really like to ask Secretary Chertoff what you found when you were there, what were you happy about that improved, and is it something that the country needs to continue to focus on? Good points. Well, I think, uh, Senator, um, uh, F F FEMA now is, uh, uh, they're doing great work. Uh, uh, and they are uh, doing what I've asked them to do, which is to lean forward, uh, to anticipate, to be proactive, to preposition. Uh, of uh, food and cots and things of that sort. If we see something coming, uh, if we have to pay a little more to bring stuff back, that's easier than having to, to move uh, material uh, when you're in the middle of a, a, a storm or a hurricane or, or what have you. Um, we did that most recently. There was a major storm that uh, came out and ultimately covered 100 million Americans were covered by this one storm, all during Super Bowl weekend, you might recall it. Uh, and we were afraid that that storm, because of the way it was created, was going to create a lot of ice. And when you have a lot of ice, it means you lose a lot of power. Uh, and that we would have major power outages in major cities across the United States. So we pre-positioned uh, a lot of things. Uh, and, and FEMA now is, is in that mode. And they've also expanded uh, their use of, I'll call social media, to get information uh, to people, to text, uh, to the FEMA administrator, Twitters. Uh, you know, um, you know, to keep information flowing to people because one of the things we've learned in managing crises is that what people thirst for is information and what they're supposed to do. So the more we can get out information and what people are supposed to do, the better off we all are. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's all, all true. I think one of the, the great lessons uh, of uh, Hurricane Katrina was the importance of planning up front. And as a consequence of that, um, the whole attitude of FEMA in the department in terms of planning and working with state and locals really shifted. Um, and a lot of detailed planning was launched uh, in the Gulf, but also in other areas as well, up in the New Madrid Fault area and out in, in California, because that's really the touchstone for effective response. When we did, uh, when we faced Hurricane Gustav in 2008, we saw a lot of that um, actually come into play as a, as a, a benefit. Also, to the issue of, of social media, um, that's a great tool for getting information. I remember we also set up, and I, I hope they still have this system here, an online uh, almost version of eBay where people who needed um, uh, resources could be matched with people in the private sector who had resources in the way that we're now used to doing, you know, matching buyers and sellers on eBay. So. Uh, a lot of this stuff has been deployed to really bring uh, FEMA in the 21st century. And, it, you know, we've had a couple of pretty light hurricane seasons in the last couple of years. But I, I, I take your point that we should not be complacent about that because uh, it could very easily be a nasty season next summer. Not that I wish that on you. That's to be avoided. But you're quite right. Um, Congressman Price and then Congressman King. Uh, let me free reframe the question about the uh, current threat environment uh, slightly in terms of the balance that you and your department must constantly strike uh, between responding to the last crisis, learning from the last crisis, and anticipating uh, the next one. I'd, I'd like to ask the past um, secretaries um, how the current threat environment uh, compares to what you were able realistically to project and anticipate. What has surprised you? What has, uh, what has followed the kind of projections that you were able to make? And, and of course, to ask all of you to uh, reflect on uh, what we might uh, anticipate next. To, to what extent our, our current projections, uh, uh, you think, measure up to what we should, uh, should look for in terms of intelligent anticipation? Well, you know, people have asked me, do I miss uh, being secretary? And to a certain extent, I say yes. I miss working with the people that I came to trust and really respect and admire because of their hard work, particularly those early, early months and couple years. It was really, it was very intense, but an exciting time. When you're around good people, it's not work. You enjoy doing what you're doing. It's a great cause associated with it. And I miss not knowing. I mean, not that... Everything we read every morning, Michael or Janet, was something you'd want to run home and talk to the family and kids about. Uh, but you do miss not knowing. So I, I can't 
answer that question as specifically as the incumbent secretary. But my sense is from the relationships we've kept, the conversations we've had, and what I've led is that the, the, that threat has evolved into many different directions. And so I think the world now for the department is a little bit more complicated than we initially thought it would be on September 12, 2001. You do have the, uh, the emergence of uh, another band of, of uh, terrorist, uh, Oliki in Yemen, who is tied to the Fort Hood, who is tied to the uh, Detroit bomber. Uh, you have now the homegrown terrorist. You have now the lone wolf that we saw uh, down in Texas. So I think, frankly, the portfolio of threats, in my mind, is a lot, is a lot broader than uh, we thought it would be. And unfortunately, I don't see any any narrowing of those threats as uh, um, the Internet continues to be a very, very effective tool, uh, David, to uh, proselytize, to educate, and to motivate. And so I think, uh, frankly, and whoever succeeds, Secretary Napolitano, is not going to see a narrowing of the threat. It may even get larger. So my sense is that the challenges are greater, not less, because the nature of Chet, the threat has changed significantly. I would agree with that. I think what's happened is it's now uh, gotten much more widely distributed, and particularly the issue of homegrown terrorism, with people who don't fit the popular image of what a terrorist looks like. I mean, Jihad Jane, uh, Colleen LaRose, for example, um, or Daniel Maldonado. I mean, these do not fit the stereotype. And I think that puts a lot more pressure on state and local governments and on, as, as Janet said, ordinary citizens to help provide information. The one other area I think is increasing in significance, and, you know, we, we focused on this a lot in 2007, 2008, and I think it's continued, is cyber security. We've seen some very dramatic publicized uh, attacks, um, not terrorism um, so much as, you know, espionage and things of that sort, but that is going to become an increasing uh, area of concern for the department. And, and how well equipped are we, Secretary Napolitano, to deal with the cyber threat? Well, we have, uh, we've done a lot of cyber in the last uh, two years. We have a whole, basically, a, a whole segment of uh, NPPD is uh, devoted to cyber. Uh, we have the National Cyber Incident Center uh, uh, across the river uh, now. We actually uh, negotiated an agreement with the Department of Defense as to how uh, we could use the tech. Uh, technologies uh, available through the NSA, at the NSA. So we actually have Homeland Security persons uh, uh, working at the NSA with, with lawyers and a person from our privacy office sitting there with them because there are legitimate concerns there. So we have to do this in, in the right way. Uh, but uh, I think uh, cyber will be an ever-evolving area. And the problem with cyber is almost by the time you're talking about something, uh, they're on to the next thing. I mean, it is really a fast-moving uh, field. And uh, quite frankly, uh, probably none of us uh, on this stage uh, are as good at understanding it as somebody who's 20 years old um, and who's grown up with uh, uh, the, the computer just as part of life. Uh, so this is an area where we are really trying to hire people. Uh, and if there are students in the audience who have any cyber uh, interest, uh, cybersecurity interest, I would ask them to see me after this program. <laughs> You're going to have a long line. Uh, Chairman King, thank Peter you. King. First, let me thank the secretaries for the job they've done. All three of them, I think, have done a really outstanding job. And I think what they showed today was the importance of layers of defense and how the threat is constantly evolving and how the department tries to stay ahead of it and tries to manage it. But I'd like to comment more, Andrea, on what you said about the media. I thought what the media did leading up to Thanksgiving with TSA was absolutely irresponsible. It was uh, it made it out that TSA was more dangerous than bin Laden. And I come from an area which lost over 400 people on 9-11. I don't mind people going through mental detectors. I don't mind people being checked out. Can there be improvements? Yes. But I thought leading up to Thanksgiving, it was actually the most heavily trafficked day of the year. The whole system was going to be brought down. I think 99.9% .9 of the people went through or that any complaints. And then the story suddenly dropped. But I think that creates a wrong impression for the public, that somehow the department is the enemy, the TSA is the enemy, and we should realize we have an enemy that's out there. It's out there and it's over here, and we have to be on guard against it, working together as one. And so maybe this is a loaded question to the secretaries, but how can the department do a better job of reminding the American people the enemy is there, it's not us, and that we have to stand together, and that we shouldn't allow any particular criticism of a particular part of Homeland Security be used to criticize the entire effort? Oh, thank you very much for letting me go first. 
Peter, I, you know, I think uh, that uh, during the past uh, eight years of the department, that's been one of the, uh, the messages that regardless of who's been secretary, the communications folks have been really focused upon. Uh, we don't want to be breathless about the threat. Uh, we used to talk about it in terms of this being the new norm. Uh, in the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s, the norm was uh, mutual assured destruction. The threat was nuclear. This is a new norm in the 21st century and a norm that we're going to have to deal with all the time. So I don't think, I think our job and the job of Congress and the job of the media is to report not to pile on, uh, not to uh, exaggerate. Hyperbole doesn't get anybody anywhere, but just to remind everybody. And I think to a certain extent, the media helps it even though they're not consciously trying to because the globalization of communication. And we look around, it seems like there's a terrorist attack of some form or another uh, that is reported on a regular basis. And I think at least after 9-11, we're, people begun to understand we're not more vulnerable because of it. We're just more aware of our vulnerability. So I think it's the job of the secretaries and, and the, 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 the Congress and all those associated with it is to say, look, the threat is real. You bet. Uh, we've dealt with grave threats in our history before. Uh, we had thousands of nuclear missiles pointed at us. We had thousands of nuclear p missiles and pointed at, at the other folks. And under that umbrella, which we accepted as the norm, uh, we built a strong America, the strongest economy, strong military, civil rights movement. So let's just remind everybody the threat's real. We're going to be dealing with it for several generations. Let's not be breathless about it. Let's set some priorities. Let the professionals worry about it. And let the rest of Americans go about enjoying the opportunities they have here. But I think it's everybody's job to remind the general public, press, secretary, Congress, it's there. We're working on it. Let's not be breathless about it. We're America. We'll deal with it. Yeah, I guess I'd, I'd add one thing, um, which I think um, I hope you take away from the conversation we've had here, which is it's important that the issue of homeland security, not just the department, but the issue as a whole, be a nonpartisan issue. You know, we've always traditionally treated defense as nonpartisan, and I think it's important that we avoid what some in the media do, uh, which is to try to find wedges to drive between people. Uh, there can be disagreement about strategies or tactics, but there should not be disagreement about the motivation of the people uh, in the department, whatever their party, uh, which is dedicated to the U.S. Uh, and dedicated to defending the country uh, and making good faith judgments. I think that's an important part of uh, uh, the message that we send to the American public. Oh, that's a perfect segue to Jane Harmon, who has always represented a bipartisan approach to Homeland Security in Congress, representing the 36th District in California, and now the incoming president of the Wilson Center. Jane? Well, obviously the press is perfect after a plug like that. Um, full disclosure, yesterday was my last day in Congress um, as a senior member of Peter King's committee. I spent uh, 17 years, uh, uh, even, well, not the first few, but, but starting in about the late 90s, focused on the threats against our country and what to do about them. And um, several things. Uh, first of all, the Wilson Center is nonpartisan, and I want to commend all three secretaries for being bipartisan in the way they have treated their department and building each on the record of the last. I mean, Wilson one point, uh, Homeland 1.0 to 2.0 to now 3.0, continuing the policies of your predecessors and trying to improve them. I think that is admirable. Um, and that is something the Wilson Center does, focusing on um, uh, risk management at the border and on immigration and some of the tougher issues, trying to be bipartisan, nonpartisan. I also am affiliated with, with Aspen in its... Homeland Security Strategy Group. Um, here's my question. We, you were talking a bit about homegrown terror, and you gave some examples where um, community uh, alert citizens, or in some cases law enforcement, uh, found these people and turned them in before they could harm us. Uh, obviously, um, communities uh, turn in people too. Uh, the Somali uh, folks who have um, left uh, Minneapolis and moved to Somalia, uh, our, our knowledge about them comes to some extent from their, their parents and community members. And in northern Virginia, five men um, uh, emigrated to or at least traveled to Pakistan uh, intent on joining al-Qaeda. They were turned in by their relatives. Uh, turned in may be a loaded word, but the law enforcement learned about them from their relatives. And uh, that has happened in a number of cases. Um, uh, my question is, how important is it to build bridges to the Muslim community? Not all of 
the terrorists come from uh, are Muslims, but how important is it to build bridges to the U.S. Uh, Muslim community in order to uh, uh, learn more about uh, those among them who might seek to harm us? And what are you doing about it? How have you three evolved um, your efforts to build bridges to the Muslim community? I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go first again. Um, I don't know what uh, Secretary Napolitano is doing, but I suspect she's building on what uh, President Bush and we started, and then Secretary Chertoff followed up. I know there's particularly been a, uh, an emphasis uh, within the FBI uh, to reach out and uh, build those relationships. It's about trust. It's about credibility. It's about uh, tempering uh, the work and, and being careful of the language we use uh, to describe uh, the jihadist. Uh, and these extremists. Uh, sometimes I think there's, for political reasons, there's been hyperbole associated with the language and a general feeling if you're a Muslim, you potentially, it, 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 you've been condemned. And I think that's, uh, I think most of us, all of us, uh, think how inappropriate that is. So I think it's a continuous outreach, uh, recognizing, one, uh, that by and large, the, uh, uh, the terrorists we're dealing with have come from that broader community. That's a fact. Uh, but it's also important to realize that uh, of the 1.3 or 4 billion Muslims in the world, uh, we may have some of those jihadists within it, but uh, by and large, uh, our responsibility is to reach out and to uh, embrace, as we've done for every religious belief, embrace them and build that level of trust and credibility where, like the families in Minnesota and the families in Northern Virginia come in. And it's just like the man who went into the embassy to talk about the Detroit bomber. Uh, to talk about that. That's, that's the kind of information, one of the sources we need to get the actor before they act. Uh, yeah, and we have built on that. Uh, and uh, uh, the FBI has uh, efforts. Uh, we participate in those. We have a civil rights and civil liberties uh, component within the department. Uh, they have an active outreach program. Uh, the Muslim community, in terms of the uh, associations, uh, uh, have reached out to us uh, and, and invited us uh, to uh, colloquia, to, to other meetings in their communities and so forth. So uh, there's an active bridge building uh, going on. Uh, and it's important because, as Tom said, um, it's in, important to distinguish uh, Muslims from Islamists, uh, from terrorists, that, that very, very small percentage who seek to do us harm. That small percentage exists. It's there. Uh, but it, it, it's not the Muslim community at large. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and the one thing I would add is it's not just a matter of getting the assistance of the community and identifying people who are dangerous, and that has happened. But it's also getting the community engaged in uh, countering the narrative of the extremists who come in and, to be honest, recruit there. And so it's the sons and daughters, really mostly the sons, uh, of, in that community who become the cannon fodder for the terrorists. And it's important to give uh, the community a feeling of stake in the adventure in this country, which is the best antidote uh, to having more, uh, more recruiting going forward. I might add to that, too. I think there's two other dimensions. It's not just the federal government reaching out. The big city police chiefs and the like, uh, they, I think there are a lot of the big cities. Uh, they're, they're doing their very best, uh, Jane, to do that. And, and, and I think it's very important and incumbent. I'm going to push the responsibility back to the broader Muslim community and the clerics that lead it to stand up uh, and be vocal, visible, and uh, consistent in their condemnation of those who basically hijack their religion. Uh, I think we'd like to see more of that. Um, it, it, so this relationship has to go both ways. Uh, we want to trust and embrace them because they are a source of information, uh, but we need a sustained uh, uh, advocacy on their part in condemnation of what they see going on or there are very few people who have discredited this historic uh, and very, very uh, powerful religion. Now, I do want to bring in um, some of the questioners. I know we don't have all that much time, but people are lined up, so um, let's take questions from the microphone there. Hi, my name is Juan Ricafort, and I'm a senior here at Georgetown School of Foreign Service. Uh, I'm also actually completing a scholarship uh, with DHS, so I want to start off by saying thanks for uh, All right. helping me pay my tuition and uh, going to school here. Um, my question is actually about national cybersecurity. Um, particularly, uh, it's been a stated goal of this administration and this department to expand and build upon our national cybersecurity workforce. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, aside from offering the economic incentives, um, I'd like to ask your thoughts on 
uh, how we can provide the right cultural incentives to get more information security specialists, um, basically hackers or those who have the capabilities to be hackers, into our government. Uh, I think that our nation has one of the most talented and skilled communities of hackers in the world, and that's a great that's a great resource for us to tap in terms of going forward with our cybersecurity mission. Um, and uh, but unfortunately, it seems that many of the members of this community, um, and in some cases, some of the best of them, uh, remain distrustful and wary of the government uh, because of security concerns and regulation policies. I'm curious what your insights are on meeting this challenge and uh, how we can possibly bridge this trust gap and get more information security specialists, uh, those, who the best at, those who are the best at what they do, uh, to working with us and improving our national security. Well, I think uh, I'm good. I'll dive in there. First of all, um, uh, you know, we reach out uh, directly. Um, you know, the, the Office of Personnel Management has actually given the department direct hire authority to hire a thousand cybersecurity specialists. Um, so that's, uh, you know, so th that will be helpful, I think. But the problem we have is uh, in you're exactly as you stated that people are, uh, who are really good, who you want, they're not, they're not, they have not thought about working for the government. Uh, uh, and so uh, we do have, we have re uh, recruited um, some very nationally known uh, hackers to be on our Homeland Security Advisory uh, Committee. Uh, we speak uh, and, and are present at, um, there are actually hacker conventions, um, and we are, we are there. Um, uh, we're there. <laughs> you see some of us. Uh, no. um, uh, uh, but the, but uh, to a larger point, and this goes actually beyond cyber, uh, is uh, talking with young people about careers in public service. Uh, and, it, and it's more than a, a, a year or two at a particular nonprofit or whatever. It's really investing your life in your talents uh, uh, working for the greater good, uh, working uh, uh, in, in the government, which is where you can achieve that, and then providing the opportunities and to demonstrate that, you know what, your skills are needed uh, to protect the country. Um, your knowledge is needed, your intellect, your energy, what have you. Uh, and so anything we can do uh, to uh, persuade young people that, you know what, this is a great way to invest your talents um, uh, is something that we're willing to, to, to do. I mean, and, and in fact, I'm giving a series of lectures around the country this year at universities, um, uh, and they're on different subject matter, uh, but they're also designed to introduce the department to university students as a place to uh, have a career, and, and a very rewarding one, actually. If I could add one more to that, I, uh, it'd be great... If, if Congress would take a look and revisit the rules and restrictions and regulations about engaging the private sector more intimately in developing partnerships with the federal government. I know from my own experience, even early on, when I tried to attract some very, very talented people to help me on an advisory board, remember, this was saying we are just starting. The, the regulations associated with, bring, with bringing in Private citizens, engaged, smart, talented, experienced private citizens to sit side by side with government in order to advance a broader interest uh, of security and safety, it is very, very difficult. The regs are written to the extent that we're not really going to trust people in the private sector because, heaven forbid, they might be financially advantaged either with a contract or just general information. And I think it's about doggone time that this country recognized that as talented pool of people we have in the federal government, the wealth of experience and capability in the private sector ought to be brought in to the federal government to deal with a lot of issues, not just with cybersecurity. So what I hope, and I think the president even alluded to a more efficient or effective government in his State of the Union, I hope part of that process is making it a lot easier for people in the private sector to join in partnership I mean, all these regs are written to take care of an aberrant behavior, somebody who might be misguided, and we ought to just trust the Americans who want to work with government, make it a lot easier for them to partner with us, particularly in the area of cybersecurity. We've got a lot of talented people in the federal government. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, we only have about five minutes left, so Sorry, let's long yeah, I just want to try say to thanks. 
try to get to uh, some more questions there. Thank you all yeah. for joining us. My name is uh, uh, Drew Indorf. I'm a senior in the School of Foreign Service here. I'm currently taking Secretary Madeleine Albright's course on national security. We have an upcoming day-long role play um, as a review of AFPAC policy in which I'm playing you, Madam Secretary. Um, so my question for you is, from the perspective of the Department of Homeland Security, what are your priority objectives for Afghanistan and Pakistan, and are there any specific policies or policy changes that you would see towards that end? Well, I think, uh, uh, first of all, we have uh, people from the department working in Afghanistan. I mean, part of the issues, one of the issues there is to translate from a military presence to civilian and to capacity build in Afghanistan. So I was there myself, uh, 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 I spent New Year's Eve actually there, um, and what we were doing is, is helping them build uh, a customs department. Uh, uh, because if they could collect customs revenue, uh, that's revenue they can use to uh, fund their government, uh, and, and that that in and of itself is very, very important. So one of our objectives in Afghanistan is to have a, a transition from a military to a civilian uh, uh, government. Uh, with respect to Afghanistan and Pakistan, obviously uh, a key objective is to work with the governments of both countries uh, to identify um, al-Qaeda, al-Qaeda havens, uh, and to work to uh, eliminate those. And good luck with your role playing, but the message to all of you students is you can get into public service and look forward to spending New Year's Eve in Kabul. <laughs> it's a great life. <laughs> yes, sir. Thorn Smith, School of Foreign Service, Georgetown University. Did President Bush hamper the national will by not seeking a congressional declaration of war against Al Qaeda? Or would it have been counterproductive had he done so? And what do you feel his response then has, what effect it has today? I think the president felt that uh, given that joint resolution that it was passed with strong bipartisan support in both chambers, gave him the authority to uh, live up to what he considered to be his primary responsibility as president and that's protect and defend the United States. So the, the historians may look back and say there should have been a declaration of war, but the Congress acted very swiftly in a bipartisan manner, overwhelming vote in both chambers, and the president took that, uh, as I think any president would have done, as appropriate responsibility to, to uh, proceed to build the department and to uh, do, build all those offensive and security measures that he felt was necessary to protect and defend the United States. I'm Joe Donovan. I'm a co-chair for the commercial facility sector. Uh, Madam Secretary, I'd like to say first and foremost, the changes that have occurred in FEMA are absolutely wonderful. Uh, the private sector really enjoys working with uh, Administrator Fugate and Rich Serino, and we hope you keep that, that effort up. My question is, what is the role of the private sector in the rollout and the success of fusion centers? Fusion centers, uh, I think, uh, I don't know, Tom, whether you started them or, uh, Michael, you did, they, but it is a, what they are, are co-located state, local, federal entities, um, not only personnel, but databases. And the idea is to be able to uh, more quickly share information among different levels uh, of government, uh, but also uh, to receive information back, uh, because... Uh, one of the things that happens here in Washington, D.C., is they forget that there's the whole big country out there uh, from which information uh, need, uh, needs to be uh, garnered that can be used to analyze trends, tactics, techniques uh, uh, that may be employed. Uh, they are also all hazards, uh, and, and that is where the, the fusion centers also deal with, say, for example, public health. Uh, and when we had H1N1, uh, we employed the uh, fusion centers to uh, get out information about vaccines, vaccine availability, uh, and the like. Um, and uh, different fusion centers have different uh, relationships with the private sector. Primarily, uh, most I've seen it's with critical infrastructure, your, your utility segment, your water, uh, and so forth. And I think that um, as we look at fusion centers around the country, that is a relationship and a capacity uh, that we are encouraging. Uh, that is part of the grant guidance we are giving, uh, and that's something that we look for when we, when we travel. There are now 72 of the fusion centers. 
morning. Ian Hay with CERN, the Southeast Emergency Response Network, and actually a HISN CI pilot established under the leadership of Secretary Ridge. My question is similar to Joe. We didn't plan this, but in terms of the recent attacks, Operation Hemorrhage, toward our critical infrastructure, both abroad and, and here, what do you see, for all three of you, what do you see as the role of engaging private sector with street-level real-time information sharing? Well, I'm, I think you know, one of the critical issues is how do you make information available in real time? And there are structures in place that do that, various centers and, and the sector coordinating councils in the department. But I think one of the challenges is to turn that around quickly and to make sure information gets out in a kind of a, a telephone tree. A lot of that, frankly, could probably be done online. And I think one of the obstacles has been the clearance process. Probably the biggest complaint I've heard since I've left uh, in terms of, of people in the private sector saying they can't get access to information <clears throat> or some of the arcane requirements about getting a clearance and who has to hold the clearance and what you have to be doing in order to have, maintain a clearance. And simplifying that process, particularly for clearances at the secret level, I think would go some distance to making information available more quickly. I think we're uh, just about out of time, and that'll, so that'll have to be the last question. I want to, again, thank the Aspen Institute, thank Georgetown School of Foreign Service. Uh, the conversation will continue, by the way. Secretary Chertoff and Secretary Ridge are frequent guests. Secretary Napolitano will be my guest today at 1 o'clock on my program on MSNBC, so I look forward to that. Um, and make sure you show up. <laughs> um, <laughs> If I'm not there, now you all we, should be worried. Now that we've announced it. Um, I also wanted to point out that the Aspen Security Forum is going to have its July program in Aspen, uh, July 27th to 30th. So more details on www.aspensecurityforum.org. So the Aspen Institute is going to continue a, an even deeper conversation about this in a wonderful venue, I might add. Uh, again, thanks to Walter Isaacson, to our members of Congress. I see John McLaughlin there, uh, a former CIA director and active participant, of course, here at Georgetown, but uh, someone with great expertise. I think the German ambassador, our friend from um, the Federal Republic of Germany, was here, um, and I neglected to inter introduce him. But thanks to all, to Aspen and to Georgetown, President DeJoya, and to all of you for participating in a very lively conversation. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.